Let's take our Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 12. It's one of those uh, pivotal chapters in all of the Bible, and God is starting something new and different here. And uh, what we want to consider this morning from this experience in the life of Abraham, and who is called Abram, before God uh, changed his name, a father of a multitude, uh, is the gospel call. We want to think about the gospel call, that it is not only uh, a call to salvation or redemption or eternal life, but it is also a call to a new and different life, a, a new way of living, a new beginning in our life. We come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and we begin a new life, a different life, a better life. And this is what we see in the life of Abra, Abraham. He was called out of, you, certainly you remember, out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was thoroughly pagan. Uh, but God called him. And as a result of the call of Abraham, he began a life journey of faith and obedience to God. And that's what we want to think about this morning, is our life in this world. Is it a life of faith and is it a life of obedience to God? So let's read these uh, script, uh, first four verses in the scriptures, Genesis 12. And then I want you to turn to Hebrews 11.8, which is the New Testament commentary on these four verses in Genesis 12. All right, Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had called to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And then the New Testament commentary, if you have Hebrews 11, verse 8. Uh, you know, Abraham is one of the most quoted, referred to a person from the Old Testament Quoted in the New Testament. Hebrews 11.8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, there is the call of God, the gospel call. When he was called to go out into a place which he would after receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing where he was going. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, and uh, Father, we ask that the Spirit of God would speak to us. Uh, Father, we live in this world. It is a very dark, it is a very difficult world in which we live, and yet you call upon each believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter the obstacles, the challenges, no matter the hardships, to live a life of faith and obedience to God. So, Father, we ask that you would bless the word of God to us and help us. Give us grace to live a life to the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we think about this world in which we live, and it is, I want to suggest, it is no different than the world that Abraham lived in. Nothing of essential has changed. There are superficial changes, certainly, uh, between our world and, and Abraham's world. But yet it was a world that was thoroughly pagan, difficult to live, 
It had its hardship, its difficulties. It had its problems, uncertainties of life. You know, everything that we face are the very same things that Abraham faced. But yet he was able to rise above it. He is like this mountain in the Old Testament who has lived a life, lived a life of faith and a life of obedience to God. And so as we think about the life of Abraham, we should ask ourselves, uh, what, what kind of life am I living in this world? Is my life like the life that Abraham has lived in this world. You know, I think it's so foolish for people to make the objection that the Bible has nothing relevant to say to life. That the Bible is a, a Bible of dates and places, geography, genealogies, and all these things, but what does it actually have to say about life? It has nothing practical to say about life. It is more interested in doctrine and theology than it is in the practical issues of life. But what I would suggest to you is that there is no more practical book, no more up-to-date book than the Bible that deals with the issues of life. Because it is the Bible and only the Bible that tells us how to face life with its problems and its difficulties, its hardships, its disappointments, and it also, the Bible, is a book that tells us not only how to face life, but how to face death. To, to die victoriously, to die in peace. So we come to this episode uh, in the life of Abraham that we might know how to live our life in this world. You know, to me, there are two ways of, of living life and facing life, living out your, your life in this world. To me, there are only two ways of doing so. One is to live your life just as the world is living their, their lives in this world. It, it's a life of materialism, a life of pleasure. It is a life of the here and now. It is getting all the enjoyment you can out of life uh, because this is all you get. Sometimes you hear the phrase, you, you only go around once in life. And, and so you go for the brass ring. You know, this is how so many around us are living, living only for today. There is no hope. There is nothing beyond this life for them. So that you, you, we look at people today. And why are they miserable? And why are they unhappy? It is because their, their lives are empty. Their lives are superficial. They're trying to fill their life with something, to find some meaning and purpose in life. And so they try this or they try that to try to fill the void and the emptiness in their life to find some kind of sense of peace and meaning in life. That's one way to approach life. Like the unbeliever who is miserable, and unhappy, those have turned their back upon God. There's a second way to live our life, and this is the life that God wants every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ to live, and it is this life like Abraham, a life of faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, went out. A life of faith but it is also a life of obedience that he obeyed and went out, not knowing where he was going. You see, this is the, the journey of faith. This is the life that God has called us to live. It is a life, as we see in the life of Abraham, it is a different way to live than the world, and it is a better way to live than this world. Abraham walked in fellowship and communion with God. Abraham worshipped the God of heaven. And as the scripture tells us in Hebrews 11, 8, he went out not knowing where he was going. God called him to a land that I will show you. Can you ever imagine loading up a U-Haul and waiting on God to give you directions? 
This is what Abraham, can you imagine the amount of faith that this took uh, on the part of Abraham to leave everything that was familiar to him, comfortable to him, and to leave it all behind and to go on this journey of faith. You know, we, we think about life. You know, the unbeliever, they think, oh, life, it's ruled by fate and by chance. I, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, I hope nothing bad happens to me. But, you know, that is not the journey of faith of a believer. He went out not knowing where he was going. And the old Puritans used to say in their commentary on this verse, he didn't know where he was going. He didn't need to know because he knew who was going with him. And that's our life as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what's going to happen to us from day to day. We don't know what's going to befall us, what's going to happen to us. But we have a God who is going with us, walking with us. Can you think of anything more thrilling in life to walk in daily fellowship and communion with the God of heaven, the sovereign God rules over this earth and rules over my life, and to go wherever he directs me to go. Let me tell you about an experience I had. In in August of 1976, I was discharged from the Navy, eight years service. God had uh, called me uh, about midterm and uh, second enlistment in the Navy into ministry. And, uh, you know, for three years, uh, you know, uh, instead of just biding my time, uh, I'd go to a, a gospel mission two or three times a month. You know, the, there was a number of gospel missions in San Francisco. And so I'd go and practice this craft of preaching. Well, the day came, August 1976, that it's going to be discharged. And uh, prior to being discharged, my wife Beverly and I, we flew down to Phoenix, Arizona. I was going to go to Southwestern Baptist Bible College, Phoenix, Arizona. Beverly grew up in Arizona in Phoenix, and so thought that'd be a great place to live. So we went to a house and, you know, got up this, the GI Bill and got a v, tried to get a VA loan. We flew back to San Francisco. The week I was being discharged, get a call from the realtor. The house didn't go through. So what do you do? Well, you know, the Navy, they packed us up, put our stuff in storage in, in Arizona and Phoenix, and we went to Phoenix. Didn't know where we were going to live, didn't have a job, didn't know what we were going to do. But we really strongly felt that's where God wanted us. Well, the realtor finally, you know, we rented a, a motel room, lived in that for a couple, a few weeks. And the uh, realtor got a hold of us and uh, found a, a, a home for us. All we'd have to do is just put some money down and take over the payments. And that's what we did. We went out. You know, that's a life of faith. It's a journey. We don't know what God's going to do. And this is what Abraham did. It's this life of faith and obedience to God. Abraham lived a life of faith, a new kind of faith, a new kind of life. And this is the kind of life that God calls upon us to live. A life, it doesn't matter that we know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. We leave that in the hands of God. We walk by faith. We walk in trust of God that he knows the way and he's going to lead us. And we have nothing to worry about whatsoever. This morning, if you look at the back of your bulletin, we want to look at three, three points in regard to the glory of our God. And they center around three attributes of God. As seen in this calling of Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, calling him out of a life of paganism to a life of fellowship and communion with God. 
So you see the first one is the very long suffering of God. Now when we come to Genesis 12, I've said, this is a new start, a new beginning in the program of God. God is doing something different here in the call of Abraham. But when we do a quick review of the first uh, 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, we can see demonstrated the very long suffering of God with a human race. You think, first of all, there are three demonstrations of God's long suffering in these 11 chapters. The first is with the creation of Adam and Eve. And we all know the sad story of Adam and Eve. How God put them in the garden. He created them and made them in the image and likeness of God. He, he walked with them, the scripture tells us in Genesis 3. He walked with them in the cool of the day. And this was God's intent, is to have fellowship and communion with Adam and Eve in the garden. But we all know the sad story we get to Genesis 3 and the folly of Adam and Eve to believe the voice of the tempter and there to intimate that, that God made this prohibition not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that somehow God is keeping you from something. God is keeping you down. God is keeping you from your full potential in life. Just eat of this tree and you'll be like God. And this sounded so good. They went and they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here's the first demonstration of the long suffering of God. What did God do in response to the disobedience of Adam and Eve? A clear disobedience against the will of God expressed in Genesis 2. There was judgment, of course, and all the ills we see today in society is the result of Genesis 3. But amid all the curse and the judgment that befell Adam and Eve and the serpent, you remember the great promises in Genesis 3, verse 15, of a seed that would come. You see, the long-suffering of God he could have hurled Adam and Eve into oblivion, been done with it. No. He gives this wonderful promise that a Savior would come, the seed of a woman, to put everything right. Genesis 3. Then you go to Genesis 6, three chapters later. And there we see Noah and the flood. In Genesis 6, verse 5, the scripture says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of their heart was only evil continually. And God was going to bring a flood. But again, here's the long-suffering of God. He called Noah to build an ark and entered into the ark were eight souls that were preserved through the flood. The long suffering of God. When the ark finally settled on dry ground in Genesis 9, God told Noah is to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, you come two chapters later to the Tower of Babel. And here, if you look at uh, uh, Genesis 11, verse 4, here, the, instead of the, the population migrating throughout the earth, they rather, in disobedience to God, gathered in one place, one locality, and they decided that they are going to make a name for themselves. Look at verse 4, Genesis 11. And they said, this is the thinking of the population. And they said, as they saying among themselves, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower 
whose top is in the heavens. Now, whose top is in the heavens. Now, the Hebrew for the heavens is in their thinking and their pagan thinking. This is where the gods are, to worship the gods of heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Notice that. Let's make a name for ourselves. You look at Genesis 12, verse 2, and your name shall be great. You see the difference? You see, we live in a society, don't we, where people want to have a great name, a name of recognition, a name of power. That was Genesis 11. Now the question for us is, what kind of name are we making for our God? You see, God wants our name to be great. His name shall be great. Well, we know the sad ending of this Tower of Babel. God came down in judgment and scattered them. Scattered them throughout all the earth. Gave them different languages. So they could not understand each other. Do you see the sovereignty of God in all of this? You think in the day in which we live, do we not see the sovereignty of God or the long suffering of God? Do we not see the infinite patience of God? Why doesn't God just come and destroy this earth that's godless? It's turned his back on God. It is the long suffering of God, the patient dealing of God with this earth that is in rebellion against God. So we think of the uh, long suffering of God, this attribute of God. This is the glory of our God to deal patiently with this human race. And then the second point is the, the loyalty of God. You know, when I, uh, early after I was saved, um, we were at, attending while I was in the Navy, uh, Calvary Baptist Church in San Francisco. And the, you know, the pastor, he would always illiterate. And he, you know, I talked to him about it. And he said, well, that's the way you get people to remember your message. You illiterate. Well, that's what I've been doing all my life now. Well, you know, I couldn't find anything about the, because you know, the point really is the faithfulness of God, but that doesn't start with L. <laughs> so it's the loyalty of God. Oh, that's good. You know, I've got a theosaurus I had since the early 70s, and I've worn it, and I look at these words. And uh, you know, so when you think of the loyalty of God, I'm, it's the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God to his promise. The promise he made in Genesis 3.15. In spite of the fact that the human race was determined to live in defiance and disobedience to God. God never, ever turned his back on this world. You know, there's a wonderful comfort for us. You know, even this world that as we know it today... has a future. The kingdoms of this earth, we're told in Revelation 11, the kingdoms of this earth shall become the kingdoms of, of, his, of his Christ and of our Lord. You think about our world. It's reaping the misery of a life in rebellion against God, a life of disobedience. People are miserable. People are unhappy. And why? They're living in disobedience to God, out of fellowship with God. But in the call of Abraham, in this world that is in disobedience to God, God is doing something new and something different. He is calling Abraham to come out of the Ur of the Chaldees. He's going to make a special people for himself. 
And out of the seed of Abraham will come the seed of the woman that would give birth to the Savior, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Genesis 12 is pivotal to our understanding of God's redemptive work uh, in this world. And it brings about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Abra God called Abraham not only to leave out of Ur the Chaldees, but God called Abraham to live a different kind of life. A better way of living. It's the possibility of a living a life that is thoroughly different than all others around us. And what this means as a Christian is our great advantage of living in this world is that we live and we walk in fellowship and communion with the living God. You know, the, the non-Christian doesn't have this privilege that we do. It is to follow God and to be obedient to God. You know, the Bible is confronting us to live this kind of life that Abraham lived, a life of faith in God, trust in God, absolute trust, to trust your life and everything you have and everything you own to the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust your future. Trust your life. Whatever happens, trust it to the Lord Jesus Christ and to live in obedience to his command that what he says we will do. And God is confronting us to live this kind of life you know, Abraham lived this life as we, uh, so, you know, in Genesis 15, 6, you remember Abra Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. In Hebrews 11, 8, we read by faith. And then in Hebrews 11, 8 again, that Abraham went out, he obeyed. You see, that's the characteristic of our Christian life is to have faith, and to obey. You know, there's a great hymn, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way. No other way. That's the kind of life that we're to live. A life of faith and obedience to God. And we might bemoan the fact that we live in such dark and difficult days, but you think of this. How much different will our life be ex expressed among all the fear and the apprehension that's all around us. You know, we have a sense of calm and peace. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. We may not understand everything, but we simply trust God. You know, if, if, if we know anything about the nature and the character of God, what's the easiest thing for us to do is to trust him. He knows what he's doing, and so that's what we do. And then the last point is the very love of God. When God called Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees, what was he doing? Well, God had a view of history. Not only of human history, but of redemptive history. He had a view to Bethlehem and the birth of Christ. And there in Bethlehem, God was expressing his love for us. That great verse, for God so loved the world. He wants to express his love. And how does he do it? He did it first in this call of Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Let's think about the life that Abraham lived prior to this call. Uh, in the book of Joshua, the very last chapter, chapter 24, verse 2, it says, And Joshua said, to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, that is the river Euphrates, in old time, and they served other gods. The Abraham, before his call, was thoroughly pagan. But God gave him a distinct 
call. When he was called, he went out. See, the love of God is expressed in this way. It's in the gospel call. Calling people to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is seen in the life of Abraham. He was living like everyone else around him. A pagan life, worshiping idols. But then suddenly God disturbed him. Brought a sense of restlessness and uneasiness in the life of Abraham. God got a hold of Abraham's attention. And how he did this, we don't know. Was it an audible voice? Was it a voice in his heart? But God called him. And Abraham went out and obeyed. And and this is the great gospel call that comes to us. Uh, think I want to read a number of scriptures in regard to this gospel call in Acts 2.39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Romans 8.30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. I marvel that you... Uh, the Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And then 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You think about the love of God to you. Do you realize if God did not give you a specific call, if God did not give you an irresistible call, you would still be lost. Do you realize the love of God to you This great gospel call, it came to Abraham as he's there in Ur the Chaldees. He was disturbed. He began to be uneasy and restless. And God spoke to him, and God called him. Now, how does this work out in our experience? You think back when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Under what conditions or what circumstances... Did the gospel call come to you? You It comes in in many ways. God can use many ways to bring the gospel call. Sometimes we can be living our life. It's a routine life. We get up. We go to work. Uh, We we have our our habits and our hobbies. And we're just just living uh, what we would have considered a very clean and normal life. But then God begins to deal with this, enters into our life, intervenes into our life, and we sense this disturbance. We feel uneasy. We feel restless that there is something missing, something more than just the very routine of life. God is calling you to the Lord Jesus Christ. It may come in another way. It may come through the circumstances of life. You may have a crisis. You may have illness, financial loss, problems and difficulties. You may be facing death. And uh, you begin to think, isn't there something more to life than living for pleasure and materialism? See, God is disturbing us. And he's calling us. But I think the the most common way that God calls us uh, is through the word of God. You think in Acts 16 of the Philippian jailer, the Roman soldier. You remember Paul and Silas went to Philippi and there they bemoaned Diana, uh, Artemis, the, the, the goddess of fertility. And the craftsmen were losing money. And Paul and Silas were beaten, put in stocks in the innermost prison. 
and the scripture tells us of that of what they how they responded that at midnight they began to sing praises to God. That's only a Christian can do. Well, there was this Roman soldier who heard all of this. And the scripture tells us that at midnight there was an earthquake. The bars were opened. The chains were loosed. And all the prisoners stepped out of that innermost prison. And the Roman soldier, knowing this, he was about to take his life. And Paul says to this Roman soldier, don't don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And he, knowing his life had been spared, fell at the feet of Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the simple answer of the Apostle Paul Believe, put your trust, your confidence only, solely in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Here was the gospel call to this Roman soldier. But it wasn't just a gospel call to salvation. It was also a gospel call to a new and different way of living. Now you think about this Roman soldier. He's rugged, he's rough, uh, He's been trained uh, to, be, to be a killer, inflict pain, to have no sympathy on anyone. He was rugged, brutal. This was a Roman soldier in the, in the Bible times. But here is this Roman soldier. Sirs, what must I do be, be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, then it's, Paul began to speak the word of the Lord to him. Now you think about this rugged Roman soldier. You know, they're, they're, they're trained to be brutal and to afflict pain. And, and, and not to hold back because you feel sorry for the person you're inflicting pain upon. How is this Roman soldier changed into a different kind of life? Oh, here's this Roman soldier who has carried a sword or a whip to inflict pain and misery to someone else. What did he do? He took Paul and Silas that very night and washed their stripes. Can you imagine that? Not only that, he went out, he was baptized, they went back into his home, and he fed them. He personally put food before them. That's something only the Holy Spirit can do in a life to change a life when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 34 of Acts 16, it says, And he rejoiced. See, that's Christian joy. His sins are forgiven. His life has changed. It's in a new direction now. He rejoiced. Having believed in God, turned his back on the pagan lifestyle, brutal lifestyle, and he was changed. That's the gospel call to all of us. Let me ask you this. As you think back in your life, have you answered that gospel call? Has God been causing you to be uneasy with your life, disturbing you, troubling the waters of your life? That's God getting your attention. That there is something more to life than what we're living here. It is to come to Christ. And not only experience redemption and forgiveness, but to have a new and different kind of life that we live here on this earth. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you. and uh, Father, we thank you for your marvelous grace the marvelous grace of our loving Lord. And we ask, Father, that we would fall before you and give you glory, the glory that's due your name. You are long-suffering. You are loyal to your promise. And you are infinite in your love to us. Father, you could have 
set this world into judgment and condemnation and eternal torment, but rather you sent your son into this world to die for us. Father, may we look at our life and ask ourselves, are we living this kind of life like Abraham, of thorough trust in God, in obedience to his word? We pray in Jesus' name, amen.